In this video, I will explain what an excitable cell is and what makes it excitable. The dictionary defines excitable as being capable of being easily roused into action, especially in response to a stimulus. An excitable cell is a cell that can be stimulated electrically to generate an action potential. I will explain what that is in a minute. There are three major cell types in the body that are excitable. They include neurons. All neurons are excitable, including in the brain, the spinal cord and peripheral nerves. Skeletal muscle cells, which contract and relax to enable movement, are excitable. Most of the cells found in the heart are also excitable. These include the muscle cells, the pacemaker cells and the conducting cells, which communicate signals from the pacemakers to the muscle. In addition, some smooth muscle cells and some endocrine cells are excitable, but by no means all of them. All other cell types are non-excitable. An action potential is a rapid rise in the voltage or potential difference across a cell membrane, followed by return to the original level. In normal circumstances, an action potential has the same amplitude each time it is evoked. There are no intermediate levels. This is known as an all or none response to stimulation. When applied to a cell membrane, the rise in voltage is termed depolarization, while the fall is known as repolarization. Depolarization is defined as an increase of positive charge at the inner surface of the cell membrane. Repolarization is the recovery of the membrane voltage or membrane potential back to its original value. This animation starts with the inner surface of a membrane having more negative charge than the outer surface. This is the normal situation in most cells of the body. The charge difference across the membrane can be recorded by placing an electrode on either side of the membrane and measuring the voltage difference across it. This is exactly how an action potential occurring at a cell membrane is recorded. During depolarization, the inner surface of the membrane becomes more positively charged, reducing the difference across the membrane to zero. As charging continues, the voltage difference overshoots zero so that the inside of the membrane becomes more positive than the outside. During repolarization, the charge difference across the membrane returns to the starting level. This is essentially what happens in the membrane of a real cell during an action potential. Before going further, you should be aware that action potentials can vary in size and shape, depending on the cell type and the function they perform. The action potentials recorded from neurons and skeletal muscle are actually very similar. Note their speed. The whole event is over in a couple of milliseconds. That is essential for their function. In the case of neurons, information in the form of action potentials is relayed along a cell and from one cell to another at lightning speed, enabling the brain and peripheral nerves to respond and communicate immediately. Similarly, Skeletal muscle must react instantly to stimulation so that you can make fast movements. Action potentials recorded from cardiac cells are very different. They also vary among different cell types within the heart. For example, in pacemaker cells, the membrane potential is never steady. It changes continually even between action potentials. 
It is the timing of these action potentials that sets the rhythm of the heartbeat. The action potential recorded from muscle cells in the heart has a long plateau phase following the rapid rise. Notice the prolonged time scale of the cardiac action potentials, nearly a hundredfold slower than in neurons and skeletal muscle. That is important for minimising excitability in the heart and ensuring a steady heartbeat. I will explain the ionic basis of these differences in a separate video. For now, I will focus on the simplest example of an action potential, the neuronal action potential. So, what causes the membrane voltage to change? It results from the movement of charged ions across the cell membrane. Ions are not uniformly distributed across cell membranes. For example, the sodium ion concentration is at least tenfold higher outside the cell compared with inside. That creates a large driving force trying to move sodium ions from the outside to the inside of the cell to even out the concentration. The opposite is true of potassium ions, which are around 30 times more concentrated inside the cell compared with the extracellular space. Consequently, there is a large driving force to move potassium ions out of the cell. However, the movement of these ions is prevented by the lipid membrane, which provides an impermeable barrier. There are proteins in the membrane that span the width of the membrane and can form a pore through the centre, allowing ions to move freely across the membrane. The pore can open and close to control the movement of ions through it. These proteins are called ion channels and there are many different ion channel proteins, each one controlling the movement of a specific ion or mix of ions. For example, the red colour in this cartoon represents a sodium selective channel, or simply a sodium channel, which only allows sodium ions to pass through. There are distinct potassium selective channels represented here in blue, that only let potassium ions through. Largely because of the concentration gradients across the cell membrane, when sodium channels open, sodium ions flow into the cell, and when potassium channels open, potassium ions flow out of the cell. But when these channels are closed, the ions cannot pass through them. This animation illustrates what happens during a typical neuronal action potential. It shows a membrane separating the outside of a cell from the inside. The pink layer represents the high extracellular sodium ion concentration and the blue layer the high intracellular potassium ion concentration. Two main ion channels are involved. A sodium channel and a potassium channel. An action potential starts when the sodium channels open and sodium ions flow into the cell, causing depolarization. Sodium channels open rapidly, within a millisecond, then rapidly become inactive, so that sodium influx is a short-lived event. Potassium channels take longer to open, but when they do, they allow potassium ions to flow out of the cell to counteract the sodium influx and bring about repolarization. What triggers sodium channels to open and start an action potential? They open in response to a small depolarization of the membrane. But why? When the cell is at rest, it has a negative membrane potential around minus 80 to minus 90 millivolts in neurons. In other words, the inner surface of the membrane is more negatively charged than the outside. Ion channel proteins span across the membrane, so they sit in the middle of an electric field.
A region of the channel protein that traverses the membrane contains a repeating series of positively charged amino acids, which act as a voltage sensor, allowing the channel to sense and respond to the electric field across it. In a resting cell, the negative inner surface of the membrane attracts these positive charges, pulling them towards the inside of the cell and stabilising them in a position that keeps the channel closed. As the membrane depolarises, the attraction weakens, allowing the positively charged region to move up towards the outer surface of the cell and freeing the channel to open. The voltage at which it moves far enough for the channel to open is known as the threshold voltage. In neurons, that is around minus 55 millivolts. Membrane depolarization also leads to a shape change at the cytoplasmic end of the protein, which blocks the path through the pore and stops iron flow. This process is called inactivation. Because it occurs more slowly than the initial opening of the channel, sodium ions are allowed to flow when the channel opens, but only briefly, for about one millisecond. This helps to keep action potentials short. I've talked about action potentials being triggered by an initial small depolarization. In between action potentials, the resting neuron has a membrane potential of around minus 70 to minus 80 millivolts. For an action potential to be triggered, it needs to rise to a threshold level of around minus 50 to minus 55 millivolts. The threshold is the level at which a gradual depolarization switches to an explosive increase in membrane potential as sodium channels are activated. The exact value varies depending on several factors, such as the type of neuron and its recent activity. But what causes the initial depolarization to threshold? There are several potential sources of the depolarizing trigger. It could arise spontaneously. Cells in which this occurs are known as pacemakers. The depolarization could arise from a sensory input, such as light hitting the photosensitive cells of the retina. Some neurons contain receptors that sense pressure, stretch, vibration or specific chemicals and respond by depolarizing the membrane. The depolarization could also be transmitted from a neighboring cell. This can occur through chemical synapses between neurons where a neurotransmitter released from one cell onto another activates receptors that cause depolarization. Action potentials can also be transmitted directly between pairs of cells that are connected by gap junctions, which form a pore through the adjacent membranes to provide continuity between the cytoplasm of both cells. There are three distinct phases to the neuronal action potential. The upstroke depolarization mediated by sodium channels, as just explained, the repolarization and the overshoot. The later phases both reflect the behaviour of potassium channels. Just like sodium channels, potassium channels are also activated by membrane depolarization. So, when a membrane depolarizes and triggers the opening of sodium channels, it also activates potassium channels. But potassium channels are slower to open and they need a larger depolarization than sodium channels. That results in sodium channels opening first to create the upstroke before potassium efflux becomes sufficient to reverse the effect of sodium ion entry and cause the membrane to repolarize. As it takes time for potassium channels to close, a proportion remain open when the membrane reaches its resting level.
Consequently, potassium ion efflux persists and briefly drives the membrane potential to a more negative or hyperpolarized level until all the potassium channels have closed. That is the cause of the overshoot in the neuronal action potential. I've given quite a detailed explanation of how excitable cells fire action potentials, so I'll finish by summarising the key points. Excitable cells have a negative resting membrane potential at which most voltage-gated ion channels are closed. A stimulus that depolarises the membrane to the threshold for activating sodium channels will trigger an all or none action potential. Some stimuli cause small depolarizations of the membrane that dissipate without triggering an action potential because the depolarizations are too small to reach the threshold for activating sodium channels. When the depolarization is large enough to reach threshold, there is rapid opening of sodium channels, allowing sodium ions to flow into the cell down their electrochemical gradient causing further depolarization and the upstroke of an action potential. The action potential reaches a peak when the sodium channels inactivate and sodium influx is balanced by potassium efflux from the cell. As the action potential progresses, potassium efflux through the slower opening potassium channels becomes dominant and causes the membrane to repolarize back to its resting level. The membrane potential returns to rest before potassium channels have had time to close. So the membrane potential overshoots the resting level and becomes hyperpolarized. The overshoot is short lived as the closure of potassium channels causes the membrane potential to return to its resting level. I've focused on neuronal action potentials because of their simplicity. Cardiac and skeletal muscle cells are also excitable. And while skeletal muscle displays action potentials like neurons, cardiac action potentials are more complex and on a longer time scale. That reflects the presence of additional ion channels that shape the events that are triggered when the cell reaches threshold.